Welcome to Wildspire. You get to be a fly on the wall for my intimate conversations with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. I'm your host, Stephanie Benedetto, coach, storyteller, and unmarketer at The Awakened Business, helping coaches and change-making entrepreneurs unleash their inspired message and share it with playful unmarketing. I'll ask curious questions and explore uncharted waters with my guests today. Anything can happen when we step into the unknown of infinite creativity, and that's where we're going to play. My guest today is Sarah Joy O'Neill, and what a joy it is to share this conversation with you. I first heard Sarah tell the story of her miracle in a description she had written. And when I read those words, I was astounded because there was something that felt familiar. Though I hadn't had a physical miracle as she did, something in her story paralleled the miracle I'd experienced in seeing through the fears that had run my life for so long. I was compelled to talk with her and then to invite her here to my podcast to meet you. Let me tell you a bit about Sarah Joy O'Neill. Dr. Sarah Joy O'Neill is an advanced certified transformative coach and chiropractor working with people who want more out of life. No matter where you're starting from and where you want to get to, she helps you create a life you fall in love with every day. In her 24 year career, she has helped hundreds of people in many countries around the world be able to live with freedom, love and grace, achieving goals they had only dreamed of previously. She works with people in all areas of life, whether looking for help overcoming chronic pain, health challenges or anxiety, or with people looking to perform at higher levels effortlessly in sports competition, or business leaders and entrepreneurs. Sarah Joy resides in Canada near Toronto and loves the great outdoors. In the summer you can find her at one of the many, many gorgeous beaches lining the Great Lakes region of Ontario with her spouse Scott and their two teenagers. Their cat Mo stays at home. She's also an avid Olympic-style weightlifter, competing in the Masters Division nationally, and serves as a technical official for the sport of weightlifting in Canada. In her spare time, Sarah Joy is the designer and creator at Turtle Whale Designs, making unique glass art statement jewelry. In all things, Sarah is fascinated by the limitless aliveness and possibility that exists for all human beings, simply by virtue of having been born on this beautiful planet. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Sarah Joy O'Neill. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Wild Spire podcast. I'm so happy to see you again. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So I reached out to you not too long ago after hearing a little bit about your story of transformation. And it moved me to want to hear more so that I could, I could feel it more in my body. I could feel it more in my soul. And it also is probably what inspired me to invite you here because I'd love for other people to have that same opportunity to feel it. And I say feel it because... It's not the details of your story or the words that you might use, but it's what is kindled in me when I hear them. So I'm really pleased to have you. And as we were chatting before this, you said you've been seeing things, you've been exploring, pondering, I don't remember what word you used, about the bigness of us. 
will you tell me about that? What are you, what are you seeing about how big we are? Yeah, it, it keeps coming to me that we are so powerful. And even when I think I understand that or see it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've kind of got to the point of, I don't think I can express in language how big we are <laughs> or how powerful we are. And the, uh, I find, I'm finding that fascinating right now. And the, so then things that people get upset about or um, things that I might want to be different in my life, it, it's this, there's, it, it's like, whoa, we're so big, but why this, you know? And so things, things are looking, uh, the more, the more I look from that bigness, everything looks up for grabs or changeable or, oh, that could change. Yeah. And then I, well, and it also came to me that some things don't occur to me that they could change and I don't care. And other things, it come, it's like an image or a, a idea or it, it comes to me. And I, I, I think that me as the powerful me, I'm trying to find words. <laughs> trying to express the uh, what I just said was inexpressible um, the fact that I think something is changeable I think I'm bringing it to myself as yes it is or it wouldn't be on my radar at all or maybe now because there was um, this week for example my I have um, my right knee it has hurt on and off since I was 14 and never occurred to me that it couldn't or wouldn't or, you know, various sports injuries. Oh, this is just the way it is now. And I didn't care. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was like, oh, well, that could be different. And it's changing. <laughs> it actually started clunking around and I thought my lower leg was going to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and today it's swollen and it's not functioning, but it's, it is definitely changing. And I, it, it's, um, I have a sense that it, it's, the body's actually healing it. And there's other parts of my body that aren't the way that, you know, they're a little damaged and it never occurred to me that they would change. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> talking on many different levels there but yeah we are so the bigness of who we really are is so massive I know this is maybe challenging to talk about but I really want to ask you and I'm yeah. happy to explore with you what are you seeing about the bigness that we are? So in other words, what do you mean by that? We're so big, we're so powerful. It's a great question. Well, it's popping up in my mind a place to start is I've always loved the metaphor of the ocean and the wave. And so we are, we think we're the wave, we think we're the individual, but we're actually the ocean and the whole and the oneness all at once. And we can be aware of ourselves as a little old wave. Do, do, do. <laughs> and I suppose that's the level of where I was just now talking about my knee, you know, huh, that could change. And I'm also the ocean. And I guess where I'm fascinated right now is, is the ocean just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and the, the waveness of me, 
it's it's like but no really somehow i thought it was like a more separate wave <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> um, I've often, and I've heard other people say, and I've often felt like we are love. And we're made of love. And I have the ability to be conscious of myself as love, which feels like I'm looking at that from the outside. So the, the it feels to me like humans, we are love, but we're bigger than that as well. And I had heard somewhere else or remembered, you know, love is the most powerful force in the universe. And we are that, but we're not only that. And we're... I think the... We're before, like before everything, before creation, before thought, before love, before, and when, when I look at, well, what, what is that? What is before? It's sort of the pureness of potential or the pureness of even even perhaps before energy. And that's where the words <laughs> the words stop coming at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the, the sense I have of even just getting a glimpse of that bigness, the before all existence that is us, bigger than that, more expansive than that, is that somehow when, at least for me, when I come back to my waveness, this personal experience, it looks a little different, not quite as small and fixed as it, as it used to look, and maybe even infused, knowing myself made up of that same infinite possibilities, things that once looked like that's just the way it is, aren't necessarily. Yeah. So, it, I'm laughing yeah. just at the potential of aren't necessarily. Like whether whether anything actually changes in yep. in the form or the circumstances aren't necessarily like that is so exciting to me. Like, <laughs> you know, it was the example that came to mind when you were talking about your knee, about things that I just always assumed would be this way. There's nothing that's going to change. The example that came to mind. In my life, which is very seems very trivial, but to me this is not trivial. So, is hunger. So I've had an, a relationship with hunger and food, wherein 
I must know where my next meal is coming from because if I don't have it, this is going to happen and it's not going to be good. So, I mean, that makes sense, right? That's, that had been my experience. And I caught myself going, well, this afternoon I'm going to be hungry. I went, wait, do I know that? Do I actually know that I'm going to be hungry? let alone that if I'm hungry and my blood sugar crashes, what will happen? Can I know that? No. It might be. It might not be. It mm. isn't necessarily going to be the way it had been before. And I bet if I look back, it hasn't always been that way. Every single time. The the variability of my experience, the changeability of my experience, the, the malleableness of my experience, and maybe me, or what I think of as me, this wave, has to be, if we are the ocean, bigger than the ocean, I don't know. Yeah. When you said bigger than the ocean, I saw that, uh, like, outer space, like a night sky. And I'm like, oh, it could be the ocean and outer space. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call up all the other people who might use that as a metaphor, you know. <laughs> people in Zen Buddhism and tell them, oh, I've changed it. It's now we are the ocean and outer space. Sarah Joy said so. <laughs> yeah, we, we do a lot because we think we know what will happen. Like, oh, uh, something negative, something I don't want will happen if I don't know where my next meal is coming from or something like that. Or maybe, yeah, I mean, anything. I had, <laughs> we didn't end up, we didn't end up needing it, but our neighbor's DoorDash um, order got dropped off at my house a couple of days ago. So it literally was this takeout food appeared on a, a outdoor table we have by our front door. And my, my husband was like, where did this come from? What is this? It's burritos from whatever restaurant. <laughs> Turned out it was for my neighbor. We took it over, but <laughs> it's like, you never know, maybe food will disappear because <laughs> it did for me two days ago. <laughs> Oh, so, will you tell me, Sarah? I will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you will. You will. I don't even know. I will tell you. you. Tell me <laughs> about. Well, it's not even things that you didn't think would change in your life, but the story of things that other people said like maybe people with degrees and doctor titles and things like that said wouldn't change but i think as you said to me you kind of always had this hope that they would or could will you tell me about that oh, what yeah. shifted for you yeah hmm so wondering where to start um i have had a lot of concussions in my life through various sports and various falling out of trees and things and then seven years ago i hit my head badly twice in a row and it was i was non-functional for quite a length of you know almost a year three months very much so and then a year where i could work but like 30 percent um and 
in that there were there was things that symptoms that resolved and some that didn't and the ones that didn't were quite life changing but 7 years on i still had a lot of a lot of things that i was told in varying ways from varying health professionals and doctors and audiologists and um one friend of mine who's a researcher um in neurology and concussions so you know she's working on a phd she knows stuff <laughs> um i had been told that it was a permanent brain injury and it was uh more than one person used the example of it's like you've had your leg amputated. So these functions will never change. It will never come back. Don't look at it to change. And so there's, there's a piece in accepting what is. And so for a long time, I had just, okay, I couldn't watch movies anymore. I had trouble making supper if other people were in the room. Um, there was all sorts of things where I just didn't do anymore. Um, I became okay with, I might have a panic attack at any moment. And so, wherever I was, <laughs> I got good at having panic attacks in public or wherever I might happen to be. And that that there's there's an immense freedom and value in just you know not putting thinking on what is and every now and then it would come to me this could change and now it looks bananas that for a really long time i didn't even pay attention to that like why did i yeah <laughs> like years <laughs> and I, and I've seen things as a chiropractor that healed in other people that weren't supposed to. So it looks funny to me that I so believed as well, um, because there would be times where it seemed like I had function back where I could do things. And if, if your leg had been amputated, it never reappears and starts working again but if that's the metaphor then that is literally what would happen but i i literally didn't see it because i was living in the reality of this is permanent <laughs> and every now and then i would wonder about that and i guess i, I had there were different things I, I sort of tried, but I think I always had that foundational assumption. And I'm not sure I could say exactly what changed that, but I started to, I guess I started to see more and more the bigness of who we all are as humans. And that bigness, more and more things that I thought were true turned out not to be and so i think i i just started looking at things and so one day i kind of heard it oh maybe maybe and it was fairly quickly where i started to see the disabilities and the symptoms and the panic attacks as thought as things that i thought i needed to have and different, um, I really started to watch myself create it. The, the first thing was the, like, the willingness for it to change, even. Because in that, I, I had noticed at one point that I wasn't entirely willing for it to change, which seems crazy. But it's, it's easy to blame yourself for, did I make my life a living hell for seven frickin' years? And there was a point where it looked almost easier just to continue living in that hell rather than admitting, oh my God, I did that. <laughs> But 
but the yeah i just kept coming back to the the bigness of who we are i was like but yeah i'm i'm not the person i'm i'm not the the body creating the symptoms like that it's not me and um yeah things started to fall away and then there was about it was like two weeks of right like up and down up and down up and down and then there was 24 hours where i would say within that 24 hours it all vanished and some aspects of it were things that i never thought would um my eyes didn't track and coordinate together and you know the eye specialists tested them and that's why you get nauseous when you watch movies well that changed and I, it, and the rapidity, like it went from one day to the next. And those eye muscles, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, okay, what needs to happen with certain eye muscles have to strengthen up. Well, within like a two hour period. <laughs> so that's where we were talking about the word miracle before. Like there's things where I can kind of, Parts of it, I can kind of go, well, okay, if I didn't have that thinking, I wouldn't have the panic attack or the fear. But like eye muscles started working again or stopped or, or worked less, like didn't overwork. I, for 20 years, I've had a wart on my leg that was giant. <laughs> this one seems so, it's gone within about two days. Like I would feel it every time I put cream on my legs. And it was so, it, it was just very unchanging. I kind of didn't think much of it, but I would feel it. It disappeared. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I didn't, it, it's like the, I didn't try to make things change. It was, I started to see that they could. I'm hoping that makes sense. <laughs> there are some aspects that didn't change, and I realized they're the ones that I didn't really care about. Like I don't, um, uh, I don't hear sound moving. It takes me a bit to remember because I've I've learned that other people can hear sound moving, and I don't think I've ever heard that. <laughs> I still can't really tell you exactly where sound is coming from. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to affect me in any way. So, yeah. And I think I think that's the story. I was seeing, from that, I started seeing a lot about reactivity, where people react to things. And it really, to me, looks now like we generally don't know how powerful or big we are. We don't know the truth of who we are. We think we're the little wave, and we think we have to take control and do things. And so... I. It looks to me like we think we have to be afraid of things. And it looked that way to me for seven years. <laughs> yeah. I related so much to your story, Sarah, when I heard just a little bit of it. And then even more when we spoke. Because although the reactivity in me didn't come out directly as physical symptoms most of the time, although I'm quite sure it actually did in headaches and digestive issues and, you know, all those aches and pains like, hmm, hmm, you know, the main way 
I experienced it without really knowing it was through fear that I fear that I was using to try to keep myself safe. <laughs> I was scaring myself in order to feel safe. Which, when you think about it that way, is absolutely nuts. But it's the normal kind of human nuts that I see all the time. If I scare myself badly enough, I won't do this thing that's going to kill me. And it really felt that way, not something I saw. And the, the way this would show up for me was a lot of times in social situations, in interactions with other people. For a long time, I couldn't ask people for help in stores. I wouldn't. I could. Clearly, I could. They were there being paid to assist customers coming in, and something in me would just get paralyzed. And I can't ask for help. And I saw that one, and I was like, okay, well, this is, this is clearly silly. But that's an example of something that had crept into my world, crept into the way I saw the world, so much so that I would say, oh, that's just me, or that's a preference, or I'm not interested in those things. But secretly, I thought I was really going to be hurt that not only was the thing going to hurt me, but the fear could hurt me. So it was like I was afraid of the fear and then creating the fear to keep myself from doing the thing that I thought was going to hurt me. And it, and what shifted for me was seeing that it can't hurt me. It feels like it can hurt me, but no feeling no feeling can damage me, the bigness of me. And even my little me was built to feel all the feelings. Even this wave was meant to have the ebbs and flows. And I saw how innocently I had been working so hard to protect myself and perpetuating and keeping those fears at play in order to try to keep myself safe. And it was like those two things together. I said, oh, of course you would, little Stephanie. Of course you would. And you don't have to. You don't need that. You don't need the... Like, in a way, though I wouldn't have felt it like as a panic attack, there was a bracingness to how I was showing up with life. Like, this is going to hurt. This one's going to hurt. This one's going to hurt. That I couldn't see until I started to let it go, really. It just looked like that's the way things felt. And it's been unfolding since then. To the point where I'm just quite naturally doing things that used to really make me lock up. I could push my way through them. Like speaking my very poor Portuguese with people who are native speakers. Like, be like <laughs> or going to the market, God forbid, where there were, it was full of them. The world was full of them. And I was going to have to somehow navigate the exchange of goods in a language that I kept telling myself I don't speak. I'm like, well, I speak a little. And it just doesn't, it's just not so scary anymore. And it feels like, compared to how it felt before, man, there's nothing I can't try, at least. But actually, I was going to say, there's nothing I can't do. 
I can do. I'm not in charge of how it turns out, but I can do anything. Yeah. yeah. And I loved hearing your you I I came across your story of of that that you just spoke about. Very similar at, at about the same time you heard me talking about mine. <laughs> and and yeah, some of the, the roots of of we just thought we needed to be that way. And it's so for me, uh the delight in finding out I was wrong. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> so good. <laughs> And uh, how real it looks until you see that it's not. Yeah. Now we can do anything. I think you may get, you might get in the market what you, what you were expecting to get, or you might, you know, you might have thought you'd asked for the oranges, but you get the shrimp instead, but okay, great. Shrimp dinner tonight. <laughs> the outcome might change, but you've still done it. People are so much kinder and it actually looks so much simpler when I'm not so frozen and with overthinking, paralyzed by thinking, I get really creative in communicating and doing things. I become agile in a way that I couldn't have been, that I, I didn't see as available otherwise. It doesn't mean that I instantly become proficient in a language, although I know more than I think I know of this language I've been studying. And every once in a while, something occurs to me, and I realize that that just came from me somehow. This is just, I'm using this as a metaphor, but it's like what you're saying what happens when we begin to just question in a, in a very curious way, wonder about these things that we've been so sure about? This is the way it is. This is the way I am. This is how it's going to be. Like, do I really know that? And at times where I would have thought that I was so in the dark or so much in my fear or whatever, um, where I, I would have thought, oh, I, none of that creativity was available to me because I'm so much lost in the dark. But looking back every time I, you know, the the bigger me had me. The universe had me because something came to me and I found a way through or something came to me and it worked out or I, the, the next action. And in the moment in that, I, I often might have, you know, been telling the tale of, of the fear and not seeing, oh, but wait, you're not in it anymore. It's something occurred to you. You, 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 you shifted. You, um, yeah. There were times right after that injury where I couldn't make sense of the visual picture, so my perceptions weren't working, and 
I actually became really aware of some of the role of how we use thought because a lot of it, I just felt bliss. Mind or the universe, the, the energy was present, but I couldn't form thoughts. And that was actually <laughs> felt good. At the same time, I ended up, I, I had concern that I would wet myself because I couldn't make it to the bathroom. <laughs> and my husband was at work. But I never actually, I found a way to get to the bathroom, even though I couldn't perceive the floor. Like <laughs> I had trouble making food because the see the the fridge was on the ceiling, and it was like like the visual picture wouldn't resolve into something that made sense to me. And it was like a bizarro world that I saw. But if I rolled off the couch onto the floor, it was there. <laughs> It didn't go anywhere just because I couldn't make it into a thought that the floor was there. And so I remember laying on the couch thinking, well, I have to go pee, but I can't get there. Something came to me. Well, you could crawl there. Okay, so that's what I did. <laughs> and it, yeah, we're... We're, we're never without that that infinite creativity. And the more we see, I, I think the more we see that we are it, the more we we live in the feeling of that rather than the dark times or feelings. Or... That's really amazing to hear, Sarah, because... At first, it might seem to me that not being able to perceive a reality, a visual picture of the world that was consistent with what you've known to be true would be terrifying. And yet, you said it was, you felt bliss. There, there was, hmm, I can't say there was zero terrifying. And there was a lot of bliss, though. <sighs> I'm not sure I could distinguish why one the other. I think, I think when I focused on, oh crap, my brain's really messed up. <laughs> See, but I had to form a scary thought, or I had, I had to, I even had to go to the level of saying, like it was obvious my brain was messed up, but I had to make that a problem for the world to be terrifying. And so actually now as I'm talking, it's kind of newly coming out. I'm seeing, this is brand new, brand new. <laughs> um, it Sustaining the terrifying took work and I didn't have that much capacity. And so it, it, I, I would, it, it was like, I could only do so many bicep curls and it would, my arm would stop lifting so the terrifying would stop because I couldn't generate that thinking for lo that long and the default is bliss and I found that so what well, was awesome <laughs> it was just really awesome um, but I guess yeah knowing that I wouldn't wish it on anybody to have to go through it <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the actual experience of it was really interesting. <laughs> no. Yeah. It takes work to sustain fear. <laughs> Which I think that's a miracle in itself. Because what, what most people think, what I used to think, was that the opposite was true. It took work to get to a good feeling. It took work to get to an insight. It took work to, but it doesn't. That's what we're made for. Yeah. So glad I was wrong. <laughs> that could be the title of this whole, this whole thing. I am so glad I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. A dear friend of me of mine describes it in a metaphor that our resilience is like when you try to hold a beach ball under the water 
like this, it's really hard to hold it under there. For, and the minute you take your hands off, pop. Like that's, that's us, actually. And the reason we get so drained and stressed and tired and exhausted and, yeah. And we don't know we're doing it. It's not on purpose. I didn't scare myself because I liked making myself miserable. I just thought I needed to, to be okay. Yeah. You were talking earlier how cute we are sometimes as humans and the things we do because we thought we needed to. <laughs> It's just that feeling is coming off like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even feel bad about it. No. Like, I'm not mad at myself at all. I don't regret it. I mean, it would have been nice to not do that, but I did pretty damn well, and you did too, right? Like, Again, the resilience, even holding the ball down, you can't keep it from showing the brilliance of what we are still comes through. Yeah. They were holding the ball down and we're smiling and, you know, doing math at the same time. Oh, look at me. I'm holding the ball down and doing calculus and I'm smiling and look pretty. <laughs> but, yeah, so much easier to just not hold the damn ball down. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Maybe I also don't have to do calculus. Ooh. <laughs> huh. Ooh. That one's not required either. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So it, is there anything in your heart, Sarah, that you'd like to, to share with people that you really wish they knew? Yeah, looking to, I, so I, like I'm changing my mind as I, as I <laughs> it's halfway out my mouth and I'm changing my mind. Looking to how amazing we are and the bigness of, of how we are. But if somebody was in a space where they weren't feeling that at all, it would be look to the positive, look to the best feeling you can find in that moment. And then looking to the next best feeling, looking to the next positive and looking to the next, is there the, the next aspect that of that light, just always looking to the light, looking to the, the good feeling. If it doesn't feel good, where is the best feeling feeling? Yeah, because that's, that is what is real. And all the other stuff that looks so real, thankfully isn't. <laughs> yeah, that is what is really, really, really real. <laughs> it's the love and the good feeling. Mm. Yeah. The really real real, like that. <laughs> The no, really, it's really real. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Sarah, if people would like to connect with you, where is the best place they can go to learn more about what you're up to in the world? What I am up to in the world? Well, um, as I was telling you earlier, I'm on social media, which I find that funny because it's new. <laughs> Um, and my website is Dr. Sarah O'Neill. Uh, what is it? Dr. Sarah O'Neill.com. 
Um, and there's lots of things there. I'm actually developing a new website, but that's going to take a little while. That's going to be sarahjoyoneal.com, but don't worry about that one now. <laughs> I know. I'm hilarious. Um, yeah. Beautiful. I shall include the link so that it is easy Great. for people to find you and connect and reach out on all the brand new socials you have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah Joy. It sure has been a joy. Thank, that you. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. <laughs>Thanks so much for joining me for today's Wildspire conversation. If you'd like to receive a weekly Wildspire email from me filled with inspiring stories, unmarketing experiments, tips for playing your way to impact and income without the hustle and hype, insights from my spiritual business journey, and more, go to theawakenedbusiness.com forward slash Wildspire. Until next time, may you know yourself as the gorgeous wild creation you are.